Marcus, mate, I'm about to film. I gotta go. You've likely noticed it's not only incredibly hard to understand ourselves, but understanding other people seems just as hard. Whether we're weighing up if we can trust someone, trying to understand people's hidden motives, or just trying to improve our relationships with people, it seems other people are like snake in oil. As soon as we think we've grasped them, they sliver out of our understanding. Bit of a weird example. So. Can we ever truly understand someone? According to evolutionary psychology, yes. With the help of a few graphs and a few concepts, we can understand any human being with ease. In the late 19th century, the German philosopher Wilhelm Windelband was given his welcome speech to the 273rd year of students at the University of Strasbourg. In that speech, he described the difference between nomothetic and ideographic analysis. Nomothetic analysis, nomo meaning laws and thetic meaning thesis, refers to looking at a set of data and generalizing the findings. Ideographic analysis, idio meaning individual and graphic meaning description, refers to looking at things individually and finding meaning from them. For example, if you take five rocks and try to figure out the average size of all of them, that's nomothetic analysis. However, if you look at the individual size of each rock, that would be ideographic analysis. Modern psychology mostly tries to conduct nomothetic analysis by analysing individuals to then come up with generalisable truths we can apply to everyone. Hence, popular psychology books such as How to Read People Like a Book or The five ways to interpret anyone's body language offer us a lot of wisdom but often paint the misleading idea that we can generalize whatever we learn from the book to everyone individually and no wonder we fall for this trap because psychoanalyzing people individually is about as time consuming as chinese water torture rather just get a few generalizable truths we can apply to everyone right right wrong to understand anyone individually, we must first be willing to look past objectivity, otherwise known as nomothetic analysis. Around a year ago, I was walking through the streets of Bristol with my cousin Brandon, and we were speaking about the philosophy of socialising, as you do, and he said, be objective with yourself and subjective with others. And it turns out this was a quote from a Danish philosopher, Soren Kierkegaard. Here's what it means. When we try to understand other people, we try to be objective with them. That is, we think any interpretation about their behaviour from our side is 100% true and set in stone. We do this because we fear the uncertainty of not understanding other people. So, our brain tricks us into thinking we do understand them, but we don't. And in reverse, we're subjective with ourselves. That is, we interpret our behaviour outside the realm of truth and instead give ourselves many passes and excuses for our behaviour. Essentially, our observations of ourselves are warped. But we stand a much better chance of not only understanding ourselves but other people better if we reverse this process and are instead objective with ourselves and subjective with others. The word subjective is defined as based on or influenced by personal feelings, tastes or opinions. The word objective is defined as not influenced by personal feelings or opinions in considering and representing facts. For example, if I interpret my friend David's behaviour of always being late from the lens of objectivity, I might believe he's always late because he's lazy, and any arguments outside of that interpretation won't sway me. But <laughs> if I try to understand David's behaviour through the lens of subjectivity, I open my mind to more than one interpretation, and I never hold one interpretation as completely set in stone. Still with me? So treating others with subjectivity is the best way to open our minds to understanding them because we can understand our interpretations of other people will always be based on our personal values, attitudes and perspectives. And we can be objective with ourselves because if there's anyone we stand a better chance of understanding with facts, it's the man in the mirror. With this in mind, we can also adhere to the stoic principle of being strict with ourselves but tolerant of others. But so far you might be thinking, well Lewis, that doesn't really help us read people like a book, you've basically just said we can never understand people. Well, we don't just have to rely on philosophy for helping us understand other people, because evolutionary psychology has some pretty satisfying ways of helping us understand others as well. According to Evpsych, we all share the same goals, but we pursue and prioritise them in different ways. For example, John puts all of his energy into getting fame and admiration and doesn't even date. Mary cares about her children far more than anything else. Jack spends most of his life's effort trying to make himself physically attractive. Sally wants mostly to get rich, and she is succeeding at the cost of her friends, family, love and health. Sally, love. 
What are you doing? To illustrate this, here are four graphs which highlight the resource allocation of four different types of people. It shows where they allocate their resources in order to maintain the lifestyle they want. Before I show you these graphs, and again, according to evolutionary psychology, there are six areas where we can allocate our resources to in life. Social resources, so friends, groups, social influence, occupation, paid work or any other social roles valued by others, children, including family and relatives, income, sources of material resources, abilities, appearance, health, time and other personal resources, love, sex in an intimate relationship. Oof. So you have the party animal, as you can see, his resources are gonna be thrown into the social aspects, such as social, love, and his income will enable him to do this. If someone is child-centered, then all of their abilities are gonna be going into child rearing. Their income as well is gonna be highly supportive of their children. If someone is career-focused, oof, you've got the abilities going into their job, which then earns them money, which then goes into their social life, which they will largely use for networking. They're not gonna to be too focused on love or children. Hashtag hustle. Now, this is probably quite rare, but if someone has a balanced life, then we can call it a rich complexity where their resource allocation is evenly spread out across all of the domains of life. When you begin to view the way people spend their time, energy, and resources from an evolutionary point of view, you start to get a better understanding of them. Because not only will their actions and priorities become a lot clearer, but the emotions which arise within this person will give you a clear indication as to what goals they value. As evolutionary psychologist Randolph Ness essay says, emotions don't arise from events, they arise from a person's appraisal of what events mean to his or her ability to reach personal goals. For example, here's what some common emotions could be interpreted as. Excited by new opportunities, satisfied and secure in this area for the most part, hopeful that future success will relieve current dissatisfactions, dissatisfied by the inability to accomplish goals in this area, worried about threatened losses, sad after losses, confused about what to do in this area, frustrated by obstacles that block progress towards goals, demoralized by slow or no progress towards important goals, waiting for a better time to pursue goals in this area, Area, accepting of the inability to reach goals in this area, trapped in the pursuit of an unreachable goal, disengaged emotionally after failing to reach goals in this area, uninterested because goals in this area are not relevant now. This is quite a complete list and I want you to understand that when evolutionary psychology refers to goals, it's not always referring to hustle culture goals of being successful and all of that. What we learn from evolutionary psychology is that all of our behavior is in pursuit of a goal, whether it be to fulfill the need of food, status, sex, sex? <laughs> <laughs> Let's leave it there. Maintaining healthy offspring or increasing our social network. And again, when you start to observe other people's actions and behavior from an evolutionary psychology lens, you can sit back and start to think, okay, are their actions either being facilitated towards a goal? Are they being hindered? What goal does this emotion that they're currently feeling indicate that they're being hindered towards or that they are in pursuit of. And lastly, as a little bonus, here are some key questions you can ask in order to understand your own or another person's resource allocation. For social, are there friends and groups that you spend time with? Do they appreciate you? Any big problems? Occupation, how are things going in your job? Or other major social roles such as parenting or volunteer work? Is it satisfying? Is it secure? Children and family, do you have children? How are they doing? If you don't have children, is that fine for you? Are there family members you keep in close touch with? How are they doing? Income, how are things going financially? Is debt a problem? Abilities and appearance, do you have any major health problems or concerns about your appearance or abilities? Love and sex, how are things going in your main relationship? Thank you for your time and attention as always. Hopefully this was helpful. If it was, go and give someone a compliment. Stay disciplined, playful and dangerous. Adios muchachos.